one more time thank you so much dr cargan to to be here with us here in the uh, in the science channel in doing light uh, scientific broadcasting here in brazil um so honored to have you here can, can i read your your bio before we you start your presentation sure. so um so our speaker for this morning is dr bob cargan bob is urban rodentologist Dr. Cargan has been active in urban pest management for over 30 years. He serves as a consultant who specializes in addressing complex rodent issues on both national and international scale. He was a member of Purdue University Entomology Department for over 16 years as a teacher and researcher in rodent control. Dr. Cargan has published over 160 technical articles in pest control and has authored and co-authored four textbooks and several books chapters. He has lectured in 46 states in 12 countries around the world, has appeared in Time Magazine, The New York Times, National Geographic, The CBS Sunday Morning Show, The New Yorker Magazine, and multiple international radio shows and online magazines. In the autumn of 20, uh, 2016, he appeared in the Morgan Spurlock doc documentary called Rats. In 2005, Dr. Corrigan was awarded uh, the APA IPM award for his novel approaches to pest control and food safety. And in 2011, he received the, the City of New York's Distinguished Service Award for innovative research addressing the control of rats in New York City. Dr. Corrigan was inducted into the Pest Management Hall of Fame in 2008. Dr. Corrigan holds the, an AAS degree in pest control, State University of New York, a BS Urban and in the Industrial Pest Control from Purdue University, and his master's and PhD degrees in rodent control also from P Purdue University. So for this bio, thank you so much for, for having you here again. So Dr. Kargensal. Okay, so I'm going to change and show my slides. Are we good? Yes, Dr. Cargan, we can see it. Okay, so I will begin. And the title, as you can see, is Smart, Effective, and Safe Rodent Control, right? And um, as you heard in the introduction, I am a scientist who studies just rodents and just city rodents, urban. So I don't study any of the thousands of species of rodents that live in woods and deserts and fields. It's just city rodents. And you can follow me on Twitter. I, I tweet educational messages about rodents, only educational messages. And so this is for Brazil. It is an honor to be here with you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. And I want to say hello, Brazil. You know, and it's through Zoom, we can meet around the world now. So it's easy, I'm coming to you from New York City. And so it's, it's very nice. And I wanna thank Natalia for inviting me and for putting on this important session. So we are going to discuss this animal and its cousins, but in Brazil, all throughout Brazil, you know, this animal is common. Everyone probably recognizes it quickly as the brown rat, which is mostly all around the world. And it's the number one rat pest for most countries. In some areas, its cousin, the black rat, is also a pest. So, you know, I do want to mention, I am a person, a scientist who works in the field. I like to be in the city, and as you can see here, at night when rats are active, that's when I'm active. And I'm in an alleyway in this picture. Someone took my pictures. I was just going through all that garbage behind me looking for rats. And be in the dark alley off in the distance, there were rats running back and forth and we were studying them. Later, we captured some of them and we tested them for leptospirosis, which is a very big problem, as you know, in Brazil, right? So 
I've been at this now for 40 years of my life. And I love my job. I love working with rodents. And it's very, very complex. There's nothing simple about trying to control rats and mice in cities. In fact, it's very scientific, just like any science. And I try to apply all the principles of science to controlling rodents. It is not as simple to control rodents as just putting out some poison baits or some traps. We must use science as I want to emphasize in this meeting today. You know, if you've been to New York City, it's a very busy city and we use subways. And this is the cover of a magazine called The New Yorker. And we commute to work. Most of us commute probably very similar to the big cities of Brazil. We commute either by car or by train or by bus. And so this is a picture showing a commuter waiting for his train. He's looking for his train to come. Well, we've all heard the expression rat race. So rats do what we do. You know, here we are with our briefcase. Here's the rat with his briefcase. But actually in many ways, it is similar to rats live in many ways, just like we do. And that's important to keep in mind as we go forth. So here is a video of New York City, the middle of the day, very busy, very noisy, a lot of traffic. And if you watch, you are going to see in the middle of the day, a rat come across this busy street. There he is. It's amazing he does not get hit by a car, but he does not. Notice where the rat went. He went to darkness. The rat went to some place sh with shadows. That's a message, a take home message for everyone. When you're putting out any kind of equipment for rodents, the best thing you can do is look for where the nearest shadow is and put your equipment there. Rodents go to shadow. So let me. Rodents also, of course, before they're in cities, they're in fields, like you see here. Rodents feed on seeds and bugs, insects, and anything they can get. And they're very good at, at being gymnasts of holding on to, in this case, plant stems as it blows in the wind, and at the same time, eating. They're very, very skilled gymnasts, athletes, very, very skilled. Same in New York City and other cities, they are very skilled. They know how to get the job done. So here's the rat that can't go any further, but he's gonna come back down and go back up here, the seam, and jump up to get to the garbage. So they're very smart animals. Here is a restaurant and a kitchen. Dr. Cargan, is this daylight? This is nighttime. Nighttime, okay. Yeah, this is when the restaurant was closed. Now, I want to mention for that last video that, you know, that restaurant was open for business the next day. And the rats were living in the ceilings and the mice live in the ceilings too. It's very important for this seminar today to mention that if you do any rat control and mouse control, you must go into ceilings to inspect and control. It's very important. 
and often not done by pest professionals. And the rodents will keep growing in the ceilings right above our food. So everybody knows rodents, and this is not a biology lesson in rodents. We don't have time, but you know, there's much that you can sit down with a computer and textbooks, and you could read for months and months and still study these animals. I've been, like I said, I've been studying them for over 40 years, and I still consider myself a student. I know very little after 40 years. They're very complex. So you must study hard to do, to do good work with, with rodents. They have, notice these big, long whiskers. These are very important to rodents when they discover their world. And they even have some on the top of their head where these, when they get bent over a little bit, tell them whether a hole is safe or not safe. So they're very, very well-designed animals, very important animal. It, and that's why it's so successful. I think it's important to mention that rodents make up 43%, 43% of all of the mammals on planet Earth is a rodent. 43% of all mammals on Earth are rodents. You don't get to be that successful unless you know what, you know, how to do life. So, so as I proceed here, you know, we know rodents are public health pests. Yes, there's no, there's no surprise here. They're among the most important public health pests on the planet Earth. Rodents have killed more human beings than all the world wars combined. Most people do not realize that. They have killed more human beings than all the world wars combined. So we know they must be controlled. That's no secret. And in Brazil, you know, Brazil, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, you have to worry about leptospirosis and rats. It's very serious in Brazil, but, and in many countries in the tropics. So leptospirosis is pervasive throughout South America and Latin America and tropical Southeast Asia, countries with a lot of warm temperatures and water. In New York City, two people, you know, just three years ago, were hurt by leptospirosis in apartment buildings. One died, right? So we have lepto here in New York City also, but, but not as much as in Brazil. So these are our enemy. They live in sewers, they live in buildings, they live in walls, they live in yards. But when they come out of sewers, of course, their bodies are covered with germs, like bacteria and virus. All of us are very aware of virus now because we're in the era of COVID, right? So viruses are carried by these rodents as well when they come out of dirty environments. So they're the enemy. They are the enemy. We must control them. We must. So, you know, and Brazilian pest professionals and Brazilian, you know, uh, people involved in anything to do with keeping buildings safe, you know, our role, is to protect food, to protect the roof overheads, to protect people's health, their safety, and their comfort. Nobody likes a rat in their house. Anybody listening to this Zoom meeting would say, I don't want rats in my bedroom or above my bed in the ceilings, or I don't want rats in my school, or I don't want rats in my, in, in my restaurants, right? So as pest professionals and anyone involved in the environment, we all do a lot for the planet, but we must do it correctly. So, so here we know we have to control rodents, of course, you know, but we have to also now be environmentally smart. We cannot just put out poisons like we used to. Many, we've learned lessons from the old days of if we put out too much poison, we hurt the planet. And everyone knows the story of DDT. We thought DDT was medicine when we first used it. Now we know we have to be very, very careful. And this includes what we're learning about using poisons for rodents. So here's the big picture. Humans, our name is Homo sapiens. 
translated, that means wise human being. Homo sapiens. Sapiens means wise human being. That name's the same whether you're in Brazil or America or Europe or Asia, Antarctica, wherever you may be, Homo sapiens. Well, unfortunately, Homo sapiens attracts rodents to our homes and workplaces. We do. And then we let them in. We do. And then after they're in, we try to kill them. Right? That's how it goes. People, we put out food to attract them by mistake. We don't pest proof our buildings. And then when we're mad they got into our buildings, we use poisons or traps. That's not scientific. It's not even common sense. So we want to be scientifically smart in doing this. So what we want to do is a technique called integrated pest management. That is the most scientifically smart thing we can do. And because we're working with live animals, we must use science, biology, live animals, rats, whales, you know, cattle, horses, dogs, cats. That's all science. So of course, we want to be smart, right? Scientifically smart. Don't attract them to our homes or our businesses. This, I just took this picture recently. This is not smart. We can't fix this with poisons. We can fix this by doing this correctly. These are rat holes in these garbage bags. These humans that work in this restaurant here are lazy. They just put out the food. So the, I took this picture, the rats show up to thank, thank you for the food, human beings, homo sapiens, thank you. And then they have babies, of course. We don't want to let them inside under the doors or through holes, which we often do. We, we'll, we should fix that. Yes, and every, every pest professional, every person seeing this seminar, every day when you leave and you just walk down the street, you will see holes like this, yes? And so it's very, very common. This is the bottom of a door where I took this picture. These are rat teeth that chew through weather stripping. This is weather stripping, it is not pest proofing. Now there's good pest proofing that can be put here and keep them out forever. But people think weather stripping is rodent proofing, but it is not. This only took the rodent the night before, about 15 minutes to get through there. 15 minutes, they did all that damage. Rodents have very powerful teeth. So this is what it looks like sideways. A mouse only needs six millimeters to get underneath the door. Six millimeters for a mouse, 12 millimeters for a rat. Here's a mouse squeezing below a little crevice, very tiny crevice, six millimeters high. And he goes all the way under, disappears, and the only thing you see is his tail, and then he pulls the tail in. Well, we can also use traps. Again, these are public health pests. So once they're in our buildings or near our buildings, we do have to control them. So everybody knows traps, and there's different kinds of traps. These are from mice. They go in and we capture multiple mice. We put these in areas where we see the mice. They work. We could use traps like this. This is for rats. I put out this trap. I could tell where to put the trap because that dark stain is from rats running along the wall. Notice the dark shadow. I actually push this trap into the shadow that I started out with earlier, with the rat coming across the street. So you push this in, you tie the bait on, and you can capture rats without using poisons. Inside buildings, they're going to the ceilings. I took these pictures as rats were going by my, my face as I was inspecting a restaurant. So they love to go in ceilings. Number four is you can use baits, poison baits, rodenticides. They're very effective. However, if we're going to do it scientifically smart, science first, we want to use baits only as needed when the other methods of sanitation and pest exclusion and non-chemical cannot get it done, cannot fix it. 
We do not want to use Bates as the first choice. That's not scientific and you will not be successful unless you use a lot of pesticides. So don't overbait because when we overbait, we know, as I'm going to show you, we now know through science, the consequences we are seeing, just like we saw with DDT, we are now seeing consequences of using too many pesticides. Everyone watching this knows the earth needs help. The earth needs help. We have serious global warming that we all, all worried about. We have too many plastics in our beautiful oceans that are washing up on beaches and every place and, and killing many marine animals. Diseases, viruses, and bacteria are increasing because of global warming. So if you're going to contribute to pest control and rodent control for public health, which I hope you are doing, we must do it by science. We must do it by science. This is a picture in New York City. This is, you know, rats and mice are prey species, P-R-E-Y in English, prey. And so this is a predator of rats and mice. Hawks, owls, eagles. There are many publications now of hawks, owls, and eagles dying from eating the rodents where we put out too much bait. It's not that only. We are seeing fox, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions. We are seeing many different species with traces of rodent baits in their systems. We didn't mean to do that. But that's how the chain can work, nature's chain, if we're not aware. So we must, must please be careful when you use baits and do not use too many instead of doing the correct IPM thing. Baits are very important. Do not make any mistake. They are very important. And we have many great baits made by good companies, good companies. Bayer, Syngenta, Leafatech, many good companies. But this is not our first choice. This is our last choice when we've done the scientific smart thing. Because these baits, different kinds, different manufacturers, if we do not use them carefully, we hurt the earth. So we must use them in good bait stations. We must put those bait stations in the right spots. And we must not put too much bait so that there's pesticide every place. Now we have all kinds of new baits that are very effective. But again, only after we do the science earlier. And we can put them out, we can control weeds. And at this station, for example, this is one of my clients as a consultant. <clears throat> Excuse me. I first monitor for rodents inside here. I don't put poisons. I put, you know, baits without any poison. And then when I see feeding, if I must, I switch to poisons. But I don't use poisons until I see rodent activity. That's called monitoring, of course. That's called monitoring. So I will stop here in the interest of time. Again, I do want to say thank you to Brazil for this honor. I've been to South America several times. I love South America and the people. I always am treated beautifully in South America. So I always enjoy that. If you wish, you can follow me, as I mentioned earlier, on Twitter. I send out educational messages with Bobby Corrigan at Rodentologist. So I will stop here, Natalia, and turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Corrigan, for the enlightening webinar. I found it so many, I had so many questions now because you cover so amazingly all the topics to bring awareness concerning uh, intoxication, secondary intoxication by raptors, owls. I would like to ask you, there's um, much of discussion here in Brazil regarding using Prudificum as an active ingredient and other formulations. And people said that only Prudificum is an active, is a safe, active uh, ingredient. Can you uh, speak a little bit about uh, safe formulations and uh, in myths about that? 
Yes, that's a very good question, Natalia. You know, brodifacum is one of these second generation anticoagulants. So is bromodialone, so is difethialone. Those products, for example, are all second generation. They are all much more toxic to raptors and non-target animals than the first generation anticoagulants. And first generation includes products like warfarin, difacinone, chlorofacinone. Those are all first generation, usually require multiple feedings. But brodifacum and bromodialone and difethylone, those products usually require only one or two feedings. So they're much more toxic in transfer to the hawks and the owls and the fox, coyote, and so forth. So we must be careful, especially with the second generation compounds, brodifacum, bromodialone, difethylone, and others. We must be careful. They are more powerful than first generation. Regarding toxicants, there are some products that uh, we call, I don't know if the, the translation is okay in English, but we call it acute, uh, rapid, lethal toxicants that people use in order to make a fast treatment to show like the pest controls use that to show the clients that they have done their job correctly, that, uh, that they are dying fast. Could you uh, speak a little bit about this lethal, acute and rapid and the uh, behavior of rodents resistance regarding that? Yes. So there are, you know, rodenticides, as you just stated, that are called acute, meaning immediate, fast, mm -hmm. overnight. And one example is the active ingredient, zinc phosphide, which there's many baits with zinc phosphide. And when a rodent eats zinc phosphide, it can die within several hours and overnight. Compared to the anticoagulants, when rodents eat the anticoagulants, even the second generation, often it takes five to seven days before they die, five to seven. So sometimes the customers are asking, where are the dead rats that you baited? I don't see any. And they're waiting and sometimes worried that it did not work. But if you use zinc phosphide acute, the customer the next day will say, yes, I'm seeing dead rodents on every place. But the problem is, one is the acutes are also very toxic if dogs or pets or people get into them. So we must be very careful with acutes versus anticoagulants. We must be very careful. There's also non-anticoagulant baits. You know, um, for example, there's an active ingredient called bromethylin. Bromethylin. And that is not an anticoagulant. That attacks the nervous system of rodents, and that also works fairly quickly within one to two days, right? So there's many tools, and I don't know how many are registered or not registered in Brazil, that I don't know, but I can speak technically in science, there's many choices of baits to use, but the important point is you must carefully match the bait to the situation whether you need an acute or an anticoagulant and or a non-anticoagulant. That requires very careful thought so you don't hurt things you did not want to hurt. Dr. Corrigan, together with this, your presentation, you mentioned uh, an important fact that is monitory. You said that you use uh, baits that are not with poison. Then after you figure out there is a radiant activity of rodents, then you substitute with a toxic bait. Here in Brazil, we don't have this kind of um, a monitoring approach yet. How we can start doing this kind of protocol because uh, as we discuss about this discussion that people want really that your job gets done fast. What do, would you say why it's so important for monitoring and uh, how we can implement this 
kind of culture in pest control companies that uh, what's your perspective on that? Yes. So, you know, if we want to say that we are controlling rodents using the smart science way, right? What we are taught in our training and taught in all our textbooks, all the textbooks of the world state the same thing, no matter where you are. And they say the smartest way to do rodent control is through science and IPM. If you agree to that, if you are in business and you agree that you're doing it according to the, the textbooks and the training, then monitoring is a formal part of IPM. It's not a substitute. You cannot not do IPM unless you are monitoring also. So it's important to do this correctly for the environment, for yourself and for the customers. And you must monitor. So even without a non-toxic bait in Brazil, you could do it a different way without that bait. You could put a simple biscuit, you know, or nuts or raisins or anything inside a bait station and check to see whether the rodents have fed on those. You could even put a, you know, a dog biscuit inside a bait station and look for the tooth marks in the biscuit. So it doesn't matter almost what you put in that bait station, as long as the bait station is closed and you monitor first. Now, quite honestly, you could also do something else. You could put a snap trap inside the bait station with some, you know, ordinary food, you know, peanut butter, peanut butter or anything. And if a rodent goes in there, you'll capture it in the snap trap. So you are doing good. And now you know, well, maybe I need to switch the bait because I'm catching them in my snap traps. So that's another option, which is very valid, very good in IPM because you haven't started using a lot of poison jet. You are monitoring with a snap trap and you're also controlling at the same time. So, uh, yes, because as you mentioned here, as far as I know, we don't have this uh, bait without the toxic. We don't commercialize here. So by putting uh, sunflower seeds, does it work as well? Yes, okay. it works as well. But you must, Natalia, you must write down, say you put, you know, 10 sunflower seeds each time you just measure them out. Then when you go back, the only drawback to that, Natalia, is you may not know who stole the sunflower seeds. And that's important because if you use, if you use a, say, a biscuit of some sort or something where you can look for the tooth marks, the, the tooth, tooth marks, marks tell you it is rodents, right? Only rodents have those tooth marks like that. Mm -hmm. And so sunflower seeds would work, but again, many things could steal them, including ants. Ah, uh, okay including as yeah small animals yeah uh, right so we would like to ask you about could you tell a little bit how did you monitor that for not uh, because we know debates that the rodents go inside uh, many other mammals can go inside of yes. that here in brazil we have i, I don't know if you have i think in the us uh, has as well uh, unit conservations biology unit conservations like parks is like uh, reserves. So you have a perimeter when you have some rodents that might be dealing in these limits. Here in Brazil, the legislation regarding a uh, monitor that uh, controlling rats are sometimes uh, mixed with uh, wild rodents. Could you talk a little bit more about the environmental conservation in this, how we can do a serious urban pest control uh, regarding rodents, but uh, for these uh, extremely sensitive areas? Yes. So outside the cities, Right. In most cases, the only rodents in cities are the bad rodents, it's the nori rat rodent, brown, the black, and the house mouse. So there we know that you know we wouldn't have to worry too much for environmental conservation. However, as you mentioned, outside the city, on the perimeter, in suburbia, and parks, 
and along coastlines, there are many rodents, good rodents. Most rodents are actually good rodents. They're good for the planet and they are important in the food chain and distributing seeds and creating tunnels in earth. So they're very important animals that we should not kill if we can help it. So you can monitor for the good rodents versus the bad rodents by putting in snap traps inside, inside rodents, aid stations. Now we know you're going to kill. Even the good rodents with the trap, you are going to kill just to get a sample. But you are sacrificing one or two animals for the betterment of the population, the good population in that area. So monitoring, you can use traps, or you could now, you could use trail cameras, which I don't know if you're using a lot in Brazil, but they're inexpensive and you can put them on a tree or nearby, nearby where you are putting out a monitoring station and you can get to see which kind of rodent is visiting the station. And if it's good rodents, then you, you don't have to worry about putting out lots of poison for rodents. You could also put out, you know, uh, we call them tracking patches, where you can put tracking patches, very simple, you can look it up in, in Google and, and research and see what the footprints of the animals look like so that you know you're dealing with the uh, rats and the mice. So there's many ways and good publications on conservation biology and how to control rodents without harming all the good animals. Many good publications on Google and Google Scholar. Mm, okay. Yeah, adding to this question, I would say to you that in, here in Brazil, sometimes in the rural areas, people at the facilities are warehouses. They use cats to control rats. And sometimes these cats as well, they play with older beneficial rodents. I, I don't yes. know if it has this kind of situation in, in the U.S. as well. Yes, That's Natalia. And I, I would like to say that um, cats are not are not a wise decision for rodents. They are mm -hmm. not. Even though the myth is the cat is a natural enemy of rodents. Well, it is, but cats eat many good birds. They eat many good songbirds. They eat anything they can get. They do not discriminate or choose. And what's more is cats themselves can carry several diseases from when they're in the wild and when they get close to buildings, cats can carry rabies, cats can carry toxoplasmosis, they can carry a whole range of issues that are public health issues themselves, even worse than the rats in some cases. So as a scientist, I always advise against using cats for rodent control. It's not effective. So there are things that people use here in Brazil, cement, plaster, the beans, that they said that these beans inside of the, di uh, affects the digestive system of the rats. <laughs> is that? No, that no, most of that is myth, you know. It's myth, right. Yeah, that is, there's many myths about how to kill rodents. You know, sometimes I hear people say if they put out a dish of beer, beer with, <laughs> you know, carbonation, and the rats will drink the beer and it blows up their stomach because they cannot burp. No, they cannot burp is true, but you can't kill them unless you put them in a laboratory and force it down their throat and, you know, no. So I know there's many myths. People use plaster and the rodents, they, you know, they plug up the stomach. Many, many home remedies that are not effective and in many cases not safe. And what about the uh, essential oils as well? They are not effective against rodents, right? There are some myths regarding that um, as rats have developed a smell system, like a good smell system, they would like uh, be far away from certain plants. We need more research to prove that. Mm -hmm. And okay. you know, I have seen in New York City, for example, they say if you put mint essential oils of wintergreen impregnated into plastic, they will not chew into the garbage bags. But that's not true. And whenever someone makes a claim, you should always ask for 
research data to prove it. If, if I said, you know, waving my hands controls rodents, you would say, prove it, right? Right. Anything. I could say anything, you know, doing this scares rodents away. Prove it, Bobby. So if someone says this product with essential oils keeps rodents out of buildings, prove it with science. If there's no proof, be very careful. Dr. Cargett, here in Brazil, we start a humanitarian approach regarding rat control, like uh, birds and rats are considered animals under protection. They have to go to the veterinarian. The pest control have by the law, but not actually occurs practically, but by the law, they have to go to the veterinarian so they can kill in a humanitarian way because it's rising a discussion regarding how we can kill, control them, not with uh, snap traps, not with uh, glue traps, but uh, with a humanitarian approach. How do you see this discussion of, uh, not like protecting, but uh, a humanitarian approach to topic of controlling rodents? Can you tell us your view about that? Well, it is a very important topic and it is becoming more important around the world. Um, so, but it's a difficult topic because on one hand, you know, rats and mice are very serious threats to us, right? We know this. So if you have a rat on an airplane, rats like to chew on the wires. So they can bring down 300 people in an airplane and kill them all. Yes. So rats can, as they do now, as we've talked about, rats can kill people through leptospirosis and other diseases. And so it's a very difficult discussion as to when and where we should be humane to rats or mice or any mammal. You know, why should a dog, for example, have more rights than a rat? Why should a cat? So this is difficult for us to resolve as a species, as a species. When do we choose who lives and who dies and by how? Very difficult. However, we should as a species, in my opinion, if we do not need to use something that is going to torture an animal, such as a rat or a mouse, if we don't need to torture them, we should kill them as humanely as possible. Now, killing any animal usually is not desirable, but we do it, yes? We do it chickens and eat chicken and we eat beef and we eat fish. So we, we compete on this planet with each other. So, but in general, if you have a choice to kill a live rat that you have captured, say, in a live trap, that should be done humanely. You should never try to drown them or hit them over the head or stab them with something. You know, there's no point in torturing another mammal just because it's not where it's wanted. So, you know, humaneness is very, very important in, in the topic, but very difficult to achieve day in, day out when you're trying to control rodents all day long. Very difficult. And I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had a solution, but I don't think there is any simple solution, Natalia. That's a very difficult decision. And I just, I'm finishing my chapter in the handbook of pest control. And I have a whole page on how to be humane to rodents when you can be. So, but it's so difficult. Yeah, because uh, if we go to the veterinarian every time we have our, our rats, how can we uh, do our job? It's going to be so difficult to the quantity, the amount. It's not um, kind of difficult to do that uh, like we do in lab. In lab, it's easier, right? When you have uh, animal experiments to discard that correctly. But um, Yes, and it's too costly. The veterinarian is going to charge you every time you do that. Mm. And who is going to pay for that, you know? So it's just, it's a difficult decision. I will say in the United States, we are now using a lot of carbon dioxide, just like the veterinarians do. 
and we are putting dry ice and cylinder carbon dioxide into rat burrows and we close the burrows and they go to sleep first and then they succumb asphyxiation our okay. english term asphyxiation yeah. they succumb in their sleep that is the most humane way humane. to control rats and that's how veterinarians do it in a different way either that with, or with a shot of pentabellum so you know but it it's a very tough problem for human beings the world over very tough do you think it's possible in the near future to have this kind of as CO2 measure to control rats in burrows? We are do we have a label in the United States we must have a government label EPA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a label for dry ice to use we can buy dry ice the same as any homeowner can and we can spoon it down into burrows and cover the burrows so we have a label for that and now we have a label for carbon dioxide in cylinders. The same way you carbonate a drink in a restaurant, you know, Coca-Cola, any drink with carbonation, those little tanks we now have registered to use the same tanks for euthanizing rodents in burrows, the brown rat in burrows. But it doesn't work, obviously, not for black rats and not for house mice, only brown rats and only in burrows. I like it. It's the best technique because it's environmentally smart and it's humane. It's and it kills all the fleas and ticks mm -hmm. and lice and mites in the burrows, which is very good for public health. Mm -hmm. I think if Brazil could do that, that would be one of the smartest things Brazil could do for brown rat control in burrows. Mm -hmm. Is that cylinder like a fire extinguisher? Cylinder? Yes. Ah, yes. okay. You detect. Yes. And if you wish, I can send you an email with more information. On, on that. Okay. Uh, ah, the only question is there's a procedure uh, regarding the the carcass rats cartman in the United States. There, there's a bio approach to discard carcass of rats correctly. In the United States. You know, if you have rat carcasses, there the advice is to either um, bury them deeply, which I, you know, or incinerate them to mm -hmm. have them incinerated. Um, I don't know of any other biological approach. You know, if you bury them deeply, Mother Nature will take care of that. Okay. Other than that, it's you know is incineration of the carcasses. And these carcasses can potentially be dangerous for health public as well, right? For like, a, there, there might be ticks or fleas um, living on the yes. carcasses. So when a rat or a mouse dies inside a house, for example, or business, when that animal dies, the parasites, the ectoparasites that live on the body, fleas and ticks, lice, L-I-C-E and mites, M-I-T-E-S. They all get off the animal and go searching for another warm-blooded animal. And so, and if they're carrying viruses or bacteria, that's of course, everyone knows how plague is transmitted. Yes, the fleas transmit the plague from rat blood into human blood. And that's how you can have you know, situations develop like that. So yes, that's why it's very important to control rodents inside and around buildings. It's not just the rodents, it's their parasites. It's their parasites. Uh, Dr. Carr, I, I think I have made all of the questions. Just would you like to, to ask you if you could leave uh, one message for, for people who you know, sometimes they don't want to kill them. What would you say if, uh, for, for that a final message, uh, one sentence message for them? Yes, it's a very important sentence, Natalia. If you don't want to kill rats or mice, it's easy. The only reason you will see them by your property is because you have attracted them with your garbage or food. So be very smart with your garbage and food. And also, if you can, just simply plug up any holes in your doors as best as possible. That's not difficult and that's not even 
hard science. That's common sense. Thank you so much for Dr. Cargan. Awesome message for all people to pay attention for. Thank you so much for having your time here one more time. Uh, it's really an honor on the reaching discussion. So thank you so much, Dr. Cargan. Thanks so much. Okay. <laughs>